I have uh, been doing this tour I don't know how many times. Some people get very triggered and have to leave. Uh, just stay together. I'll get the guides to stay to make sure everybody stays tight and we'll just go through uh, what we're going to do. Uh, but I will say this to you, I have over 30 years living and working in this community. I call it ground zero for colonialism. All the crap you can possibly think of happens in this neighborhood and it's done by design. It is deliberately created to take those undesirable peoples and put them in a, a community where other neighborhoods don't have to look at them. That's how it's done. And this was, is the lowest income community in Canada. 18% 18, 18 of the population in this area are indigenous peoples from all nations. Trust me, your people are here. This is where, this is the end of the road. This is like a refugee camp. Easy to get into and very difficult to get out. Very difficult. So on that note, stay with me. I just want to share one thing before we start going here. I was sharing with you. I've got over 30 years I sat on the local area planning committees, I sat on the emergency, I sat on every bloody committee you could think of uh, from the civic level on how to address the issue. There is no positive progressive movement because the other neighborhoods and the bureaucrats don't want to move services out of this neighborhood. One neighborhood of 24 in Vancouver and over a billion dollars a year spent in this community. Over a billion dollars for one neighborhood. It's an industry that's been building and growing economically and it causes all kinds of pain and suffering. Go ahead, Ambrose. Hi, uh, my name's Ambrose, so I'm a medic. Um, just some like, like quick safety things. Uh, just remember that these are people too. Yeah. Uh, don't be taking photos, but it's not a poverty sport tour. Uh, these are these are real living people living their lives in the community. Uh, I took, already took a walk through, like not just on my way here. Uh, be mindful of that there is shit on the ground. It is a byproduct of uh, people going through withdrawal of, of opioids. Uh, they they end up losing control of their bowels. Uh, so if we're moving fast, keep an eye on where you're walking. Just a safety hazard. Um, and another thing is uh, try not to look people in the eye, like like aggressively. Some, there's a lot of uh, like uh, mental health issues in the community. Um, so they might take it as a sign of aggression. Um, and it's, you know, and also the ambulances. Uh, make sure that we're not blocking, um, if we're crossing streets and stuff, uh, don't block them because uh, there's over at least six overdose deaths a day here in the community. So it's a bit of a crisis. Okay, we got to get going. We don't have a lot of time. So if you folks want to follow me, forty-five percent of the homeless population in Vancouver, in British Columbia, are Indigenous peoples. Forty-five percent. We make up four percent of BC's population and yet we're 45% of the homeless population. 62% of the kids in care in British Columbia, and I use that word in care in quotes, are indigenous kids. 2020, it was 33%. 20 years of reconciliation, it's 62%. The federal government is deliberately ignoring the 80% of indigenous peoples living off reservations. And even though CAF took the, the Supreme Court of Canada, Daniel's decision, which said the federal government has that fiduciary responsibility, patterns in large cities like Vancouver, and you'll see it everywhere, Toronto, uh, probably Winnipeg, is that what they use this this community for many years to dump the undesirables. Put them down there, out of sight, out of mind. I don't want to look at them. That's been the MO of the civic government, the provincial government, the federal government. They employ over, like I said, 260 nonprofits in one community. 260 nonprofits in one community. Over a billion dollars spent in one neighborhood. 
you can fathom those numbers. It's an industry, a colonial industry that our people are on the front lines. And the governments are doing everything they can to ignore the 80% of us living off reserves. They're trying to ignore the Northwest Indigenous Council, the provincial advocacy organization for off reserves. It doesn't matter if they're so-called left-wing or right-wing or center, they're all the same with a little bit of window dressing on the front. A uh, virtual signaling, I think is the word they use, about reconciling. They'll put a totem pole up, they'll recognize they're on stolen territory, but when it comes to systems change, decolonization, they don't want any of that. And this is a pattern we see with every government and every ministry. You can't just take a program, you can't just build a housing place here and go, oh wow, we did reconciliation. You can't. And you can't take all those services and put them in one community. Seven deaths a day in British Columbia to the opiate crisis. They, they, they declared an emergency uh, 2,500 2, days ago. And they're still dumping the people down here. They're dying en masse. I've done tours where we've had people dead on the streets, overdosing from drugs. What Ambrose said is right. This is not a poverty porn thing. Don't look at people in the eyes to stay together and focus on why we're here. Because this was created like this. And nobody wants, the Indian Act chiefs don't want to talk about it. The civic, provincial, they don't want to talk about it. But we talk about it, because this is where it's happening. So, this building, Woodward, just had a great idea. Where's that? Uh, we got Chainsaw, Lady Chainsaw. I saw Angie, Glenn. Look, we got a new cookie. We have a new cookie. For some of you that don't know, BC has uh, cut all of the old growth forest in British Columbia. There's only 1% remaining. And the NDP won't even stop cutting those 1%. This is what an old growth would look like. We have some uh, frontline protectors that are with us today and um, they've been advocating forever and getting arrested and beaten up by the cops. So they're, they're, they're taking our people that do stand up against the system and they're, they're beating the crap out of them, they're charging them, they're jailing them for defending the terror, unseated terror. Unseated. We've never given up our rights to our land. Never. So anyways, this is a cookie. Let's keep going. Where's uh, Ambrose? You want to talk about this poll? You want me to talk about it then? All right. Well, so this is like Pigeon Park. This, this is actually a park. And this building's just been renovated because it was falling apart. A lot of the buildings around here have been falling apart, being dilapidated and dangerous to anybody outside. They just fixed it up. And the owner of this place was trying to meet with us at, a, at my work to say, hey, can you guys come here and program the park? because it's just another way of getting rid of the undesirables, right? So there's a real push, but there's a real other push to keep everybody down here. This totem pole was carved by a Haida woman, uh, and it's in honor of... Oh, the, the residential school survivors. Residential school survivors. So that's what this, this pole symbolizes. A Haida matriarch uh, carved that one. So this mural was uh, created by the owner of this restaurant. His name is uh, Brandon. He's a wonderful uh, ally or co-conspirator. He's got a good heart, this man here. This mural, it goes from uh, early Coast Salish days. What you're looking at here are the big houses. One here, another one here. We had the, the forest, we had the rivers, the, the canoes. We are, our, our vehicles were canoes. It was the waterways, right? Not, we didn't have cars, we didn't have the horses, right? We had canoes. That's our, our waterways. And so that depicts this. And then what happened uh, in the early 1850s, uh, 1845 to 1855, mining started to take off. Uh, mining was a big deal. Before that was the fur trade. And then what this here symbolizes 
is the labor, the, 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 the conflict between labor and unions. People started to organize, started to come together uh, to uh, fight for uh, labor uh, workers' rights. And fire, it's been a while since I've seen this. And get, the, get her ripping up the Indian Act in 18, or 1950. Because 1950 was, 51 was the year they did revisions to the Indian Act, thus allowing Indians to hire lawyers to allow us to start being part of society. So this woman's basically saying, fuck your bullshit, rip the whole thing up to this day. 80% of indigenous women live off reservations. So many of them have fled the reservations about, we don't talk about the sexual abuse they had to tolerate intergenerationally on the reserve. We don't talk about that, and there's a reason why, right? Why are so many of our women fleeing the reserves, coming to the urban context? And we know the answer to that. So why that's so important is 80% of the women live off reservation. The federal government's using a distinctions-based approach, which is essentially saying to anyone living off the reservation, you don't count. And they're getting away with this, and the Indian Act chiefs are in bed with that right now. Right now. But we don't just talk about this stuff, we also challenge it. So through our collective work through the Congress of Aboriginal People, we are taking our case before the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues to take legal action against Canada's distinction-based yeah. approach. Hmm. Heads up. Rat, mice, bed bugs, everything you can imagine. Gangs taking over their units, over their girlfriend's units using it for prostitution, drugs, and all that crap. Okay. This stuff happens right now. And the, uh, one of these places got burnt down over there. I showed you that last time. Well, they found two or three bodies in that building because these nonprofits are not accountable back to the people in the neighborhood. The people in the neighborhood. They're seen as clients. You are a client. How much money am I gonna make off you by taking all these boxes and submitting to the government and then putting the money back into my organization. Some of these executive directors down here, there's no bullshit. A quarter million dollars a year to run one agency. I don't know about you, but damn, that sounds like someone's making a lot of money. Oh, and that's not enough. So then his wife, who's working for the same agency, was making a quarter million too. The shit's real. Right? How do we make sure that we're protecting our people's rights when we're developing housing policies and strategies? How do we lift up people as opposed to hold them down and tick the boxes and get your money in? Right? This is real stuff with real consequences. We're not doing too good. So I want to be up one more block and then come back. Okay. The city starts to gentrify the, the neighborhood. The first ones they bring in are the artists and the students. And so the city of Vancouver has been doing a lot of that, bringing in a lot of artists. They got the SFU over there, UBC over there, spudding these people in, eventually pushing these low-income folks out of the neighborhood. It's mostly really bad. This community, like I can't not even begin to tell you. Our office is here. I've worked in this community for over 30 years. During the pandemic, I've never seen it so bad. Like, and the new mayor, the new ma the new mayor in town, right? They're gonna clean up the place, hire a bunch more cops. The province gives them a whole bunch more money. They're gonna beat and brutalize these people like they always do. And where are they gonna go? They're gonna end up in a park or under a bridge, and then they're gonna die. Fortunately, here uh, they don't have frostbite and stuff. But across this country, I was talking to my colleague uh, Bev in Alberta, they have more people being amputated their limbs in, in this one place than double they had last year. What percentage of those people are indigenous? We don't know. They don't keep those stats. They don't want to keep those stats. Yeah. Uh, 
I, the reason I'm walking so fast is because we're a little behind. Uh, but I, I did want to stop here for a second because our office, Enwick's office, is right in that building on the second floor. Uh, if we had the time, I would have taken you in there and just shown you how crazy cool it is in there. But I don't have the time to do that, or we don't have the time to do that because we got to be back there. Yeah. But that's where our office is. If you ever want to come looking for us? Sorry? Oh yeah, over on that far end is Aboriginal front door. They uh, they literally hand out food all day to people. They have lineups like that. Those lineups are typical everywhere. It's like there's no lack of food in this neighborhood. And then you just go do your thing. So there's a real sort of that kind of charity thing. It's good. You need good food, but you need what we really need. And what this conference that we're going into is about how do we develop safe, suitable, and affordable housing for all. That's the real question, right? And so uh, charity, yeah, it exists. But we're talking about how do we uphold our people, right? Okay, folks, we're at the halfway mark. We're going to go down the main strip here right now. This is a very abbreviated uh, walkabout. Uh, normally, they go for about four hours, and we usually have a meal at the end of it, and we sit around and talk, but it's just, this has been done for really fast. This is uh, Main. Main Street is this way, and Hastings. Main and Hastings. In the neighborhood, it's called Pain and Wasting. As I said, this part is the core of the downtown east side. I've seen some academic research that said 50% of the population within a four, a four block radius are indigenous people. And they come from all over Canada and they get dropped here. Principally because we have better weather and then they have these services here, right? So it really is a magnet towards it. Pain and Hastings, we're gonna go down this way. This here is in memory of the 215 children's bodies discovered at Kamloops Indian Band. So the local community start bringing all the stuff here. So just so you know, folks, the people here, they're citizens. They're human beings. They have moms, they have dads, they have brothers, they have sisters. They care just like we care. And this is just a symbol of recognizing the horrors of the residential schools that were created in 1879 by legislation. The last school closed its door in 1996. That's only one generation ago. But now the child welfare uh, industry or welfare agencies have replaced the residential schools. We have more children in care today than the height of the residential schools. It is worse today. Know that. I got nothing to say. This is too much. Got to change. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago where an indigenous woman was thrown out of the fourth floor of uh, that building. That, not that long ago. And, and, and I know it happened there before. I know it's happened here. And when they were finally clearing this building, they actually had the women's center staff come in. There's a lot of women in there and they wanted to make sure the woman had the support services to get all their stuff out of there. They found a dead body in one of the closets and been de decomposing in there. These are slumlords extraordinaire, those bastards. And then just up there where the tents are, that's the first safe injection site in Canada. It was built right there, it's still there. And it was a, a battle against the federal government to change legislation and policies so that uh, people that are addicted to these very nasty drugs actually have a safe place to inject. They have doctors in there, nurses in there, they have, uh, in case people overdose, they have, I don't know what that stuff is called, but they have that there. But that's the first one. I know they're trying to open up many other. The number one issue around the drug issue is safe supply, right? It's safe supply. All these programs, all these services governments have been doing for decades are punitive. They, they alienate people, so what we got to do is we got to develop a comprehensive approach uh, for how we support the, the, the most challenged population. 20 years ago, we had something called the Vancouver Agreement with the federal government, the provincial government, civic government working collaboratively around this thing for 10 years. And then what happened is Harper came in, he was hostile, they didn't like it, they didn't work together. And uh, the only thing we really got out, the, out of that was a safe supply place. Those of you that are doing housing, 
You cannot have a real national housing strategy unless you have the provinces at the table and the cities at the table because they hold very important components. And somehow, the work that we do at CAP, the work we do at NWIC is how do we get an intergovernmental coordinated strategy for the neighborhood, not just the, a housing group or a, a child care group or a you know, daycare group. It's comprehensive from prenatal to death. To the grave. Let's go. As I shared with you, there's a very high indigenous population here from all over the place. And I mean, from they come from everywhere. And um, it's bad here. It's really bad. But one of the things, it's not that the people here are lazy. These people have a lot of energy to make some money to support whatever it is that they're doing. They work hard stripping copper wire, whatever it is that they can get a buck, right? So about 10 years ago, and this is I mean my moment, I hit the city manager up in front of all these people and I said, will you work with us and create an inner city economic strategy? And she said, yes. And then she had to follow through with it. So we've been building this thing here and then all the white people took credit for it and then we don't even participate anymore. But one of the action items was a street market. Yes, there are people here that buy it. All those people that are standing over there, you know what they're doing? Anybody? Not a soul? Drugs. Huh? That's the market when it's closed. So they, they're still doing the market right now, but the market's not open. So the city has had a hell of a time trying to address something in a, an appropriate way for the people to have their street market. So that's what's going on there right now. But normally those gates would be open, that place would be packed, all kinds of people coming back and forth and selling stuff. And you know what? It may not mean much to you, but 10 bucks in your jeans, like just a lousy 10 bucks, prevents a woman from having to sell her body. That's serious, right? To these big wigs that make two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year to to create this stuff, right? They make a lot of money, and I don't care what political party's in power. Why is it continuing to get worse? With the pandemic, I'm not kidding you. We had tents all the way up the street, all the way along, all the way along the other side. There were so many tents. Homelessness is getting worse. The economic challenges are getting worse. And who's on the front line feeling that? It's our people. Everyone says, oh, we want to hear from the youth, the indigenous youth, right? They don't want to hear from us. They don't. They want to hear from, the, oh, they don't want to hear from the woman. They don't want to hear from urban indigenous because we show them the results of their reconciliation, federally, provincially, and civically. This is an industry extraordinaire. So the new mayor came in, he says, let's kick all these tents out of here. And they've been doing that now for a couple of months. impression that the city's not doing anything. I sat on their local area planning committee for two and a half years of pain, watching our people get put there at the table by white people and watching them go crazy fighting uh, the most horrendous thing. They're using our people, tokenizing our people at the table. I've seen it so many times. But anyways, they finally developed a plan after uh, all these years for the downtown east side. We have over 50% of all the housing stock is in this neighbor, one neighborhood. Vancouver has 24 neighborhoods. So what is the city's response uh, on housing? 
are these things. That one over there, all of this here, is they're just put, building bigger spaces so that more people can be jammed into those places. That's what's, that's it. It's right in front of your eyes. This is the most unhealthy neighborhood. Why would you put so many people with so many issues in one building that's understaffed in this neighborhood? If that's not neo-colonialism, then I don't know what is, right? So these people say they're committed to reconciliation, but their strategy is a containment strategy. Out of sight, out of mind. Indians, refugees, low-income people, and uh, uh, refugees, immigrants, low-income, and, and indigenous, urban indigenous folks. So you can see it. This is their strategy. Can I jump in? For jump, go ahead. All right, so you pointed out this building. Um, it's also kind of interesting because um, there's been a number of mysterious fires on old buildings that have that have been happening in the community and this is a prime example of one of them um this probably went up five ten years ago i remember i was across the street uh when it happened um and even like down the down on east hastings um one of the oldest uh thrift stores uh valley village just mysteriously burnt down so like more than likely it's like you know shoddy developers trying to push people out through destruction of property I mean, there's no way to prove it, but I mean, like, it's hard to argue with, like, an old dilapidated building getting burnt down, and then all of a sudden, you know, they have the building on it. Like, Speculators on the market, especially because we're a global city, Vancouver is a global city, like, Japan's right over there, China's over there, the money's flooding into here, right? So the speculators are coming in here and they're driving the housing market out of control. To pick up on what Ambrose was saying, uh, there was a, a building over here that was burnt last year. Two or three indigenous people were killed in that fire. The person who runs that society, remember it's one of those monster agencies that I'm talking about, and, and she, they had received, I don't know how many notices from the fire department because they weren't compliant with just the basic fire regulations. These elevators aren't working. Uh, all the nasty bugs and stuff like that. Gangs taking over their units. You name it, it's all happening in these places. And there's no means or willingness to control that. But they keep doing it. Keep doing it. And then they keep cutting ribbons. And then they put their service provider up there going, oh look, we just built 300 units in the downtown east side. So you can oppress your own people. I told you um, I used to be the president of the United Native Nations, which is the uh, predecessor to the Native Northwest Indigenous Council. Our office was in the downtown east. We were right here watching everything and all that kind of stuff. We were the ones that were working behind the scenes before this was built, because there's a big Woodward's building in there. And then we helped occupy it, demanding an economic strategy for Indigenous people, and demanding housing and all this jazz. Now, it's really important like this is so important because we are up against a wave, a tsunami of systems colonialism as urban indigenous. I'm talking tsunami. The media, the Indian Act chiefs, the municipal government, the provincial government, the federal government, foundations, like they're all throwing their version of reconciliation. We have to dance to their hoops in order to get funding just to be an advocate for our people. They're trying to silence the 80% of us. But what does it mean to be thinking indigenous? How can we ensure that we are working collaboratively, collectively, for a sustainable, healthy future for our children, our youth, and our families? You have to look at the social issues. You have to look at the economic issues. You have to look at the environmental and cultural issues and interconnect them. They're all interconnected, all my relations. So when you're developing a program, a program is a silo and you're competing against a bunch of other people. These service providers don't know how to collaborate because they're funded not to collaborate. So we need a new paradigm. We need an indigenous paradigm. We need to start implementing uh, seventh generation thinking. We need to start implementing what it means to be indigenous today. 
Because if we're not doing it, you can damn well bet our colonizers aren't gonna do it. So I brought you here because there's, this is what they finally agreed to build after it was uh, done. And there's a quote in here, I wanna. If there is any hope for humanity, it is with models like this. Sounds great, eh? Eh? Sounds good? Well, we can do it all with this development in the worst community in Canada, the most impoverished community in Canada. With that quote, right? That quote is out of sync, it's out of line. It's not evidence-based. Indigenous peoples and other peoples have every right to live in a community free of, of, of all the nasties that you just saw. And trust me, you only saw a small amount of them. Right. Putting our people in here is system violence, disguised as reconciliation. Every one of those politicians. And it's not just the political parties, it's the bureaucrats, those highly paid bureaucrats that are being paid, like I said, six-figure salaries, $200,000 plus, $300,000 to keep the systems going. You need to think differently, you need to think with your indigenuity on how we design programs and services in your neighborhood but in all neighborhoods there cannot be reconciliation in this colonial construct called Canada and the simple reason there cannot be reconciliation is because we were never on good relations with the settlers in the first place what are we reconciling to anyone ever thought of that you can't have reconciliation with the sick colonizer because we were never together as one to begin with. So what we need is reconciliation, not reconciliation, conciliation. Conciliation with the settlers. But within the indigenous community, the men, the women, the elders, the youth, between the band councils and the service organizations and our people, that's where we need reconciliation. That's where it has to come from. It has to be us. Because if you know anything about our peoples, the 63 tribal nations across this colonial construct, Canada, almost every one of them are matrilineal. That means the, the men follow the woman. They're matrilocal. That means the man, when they marry that woman, they go live in her community and they're matriarchal. The women are the decision makers. The men are just put out there as fodder. So if we were really committed to decolonizing in this country, we would get rid of Indian Act Band Councils and we would start rebuilding our tribal nations. Yeah. United, we are powerful. Oh. Divided, you got a lot of fat cats over there making a lot of money off the colonial construct of the Indian Act. The Haichka, that's it. That's all I got, folks. Yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah! That's it, and we're on time! Yeah! So let's go! Scott, what did that guy just say to you there? Best tour guide ever. <laughs> you saw a lot of stuff. The stuff is real. And they're not just doing it in Vancouver. Every major city across this country, they're doing the same thing to us. Mm. Right? I don't know any indigenous person has ever given their rights over to Canada. I don't know one. But our rights are protected in the Canadian Constitution under Section 25 the British North America Act 1763. We have never given up our title to our lands or our rights. And that includes, most importantly, what I'm saying to you all and why CAP is here and why Enwick is here is our mobility rights. We are indigenous wherever we go in this world. 
You have rights and responsibilities. When I go to Algonquin territory, I am still co-sailing. I still have rights and responsibilities. Canada and its Indian Act through distinctions-based approach is doing everything to assimilate us into the Canadian fold right now under the guise of reconciliation. Spelt W-R-E-C-K. You get it? Uh, yeah, that's kind of funny, I know. So Earl Milkey here from the East Coast, asked to join this conference, CAP conference, by Wedgequam Housing Commission Society, uh, with the Native Council of Nova Scotia representing all off-reserve Indigenous peoples. Rather new to me, I, I did some consulting with that group. I've never experienced anything like the tour that we were just on it, it's really it's heartbreaking but it's it's you have to have hope you have to know that the people here today are, are behind this and and yes there needs to be system changes i've worked for the province of nova scotia i'm privileged i worked 32 years i'm retired i what i really want to do is go back and help people that really need help the marginalized the indigenous so this has been really touching for Vancouver me and uh, uh, I'll never forget it I will never forget it and I, I will work with Wedge Plum um, now they asked me to be on the board of directors I will work not for consulting fees to help that group and do what we can to make life better yeah, for our indigenous so. but this is just beyond reality just, and for a man like that to be here 30 years doing this and, and still as passionate as he is, it's yeah. Yeah. It, unreal. He, he deserves all the medals. Okay, so. and Earl, you gotta get yourself a shirt and a hoodie, okay? Definitely, bro, thanks for being here. I can, you know, share whatever. Uh,